Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Mayer. Uh, I am a Principal Solutions Architect in the Fraud and Security Intelligence Practice here at SAS. Uh, my career focuses on the application of analytics to answer questions for our clients. In addition to working with our clients at SAS, I've taught data mining and data visualization graduate level courses. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to my virtual session titled The Seven Most Popular Machine Learning Algorithms for Online Fraud Detection and Their Use in SAS. It's a mouthful, but we'll cover a lot of territory here in the next 20 minutes. Uh, this paper evolved from my effort to learn more about machine learning algorithms used in fraud detection. I moved to the fraud and security intelligence team in 2019. Uh, so during that time, I was trying to quickly get up to speed and I researched both academic and industry literature. Um, and these are the algorithms and their derivatives that seem to appear most, most often in the literature. Uh, there's no magic uh, formula with the, the cutoff being seven algorithms, uh, but they do fit within a family where you tend to see seven, eight, nine, ten algorithms used most heavily uh, in terms of fraud detection. So many techniques have been proposed and implemented for fraud detection, and we'll review the most common. And the really key piece here is not just taking those models and looking at them from an academic standpoint, but actually putting them into SAS and, and implementing them in SAS. Um, and in this case, all of the machine learning algorithms have been developed in SAS, visual data mining and machine learning. So in a majority of settings, rules-based systems are used when trying to detect fraud and abuse. Um, there's currently a shift underway though to supplement those rules-based systems with machine learning. According to a global survey conducted by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners and SAS, by 2021, about half of organizations anticipate employing machine learning algorithms um, in addition to or supplementing their, their rules-based systems. Um, and we see this as being an increase from about a third of the industry, about 30 percent uh, over the next couple of years. So again, a big jump in those looking at using these types of techniques in fraud detection. When we consider machine learning algorithms, they're typically uh, Categorize, they are typically categorized uh, in terms of supervised and unsupervised techniques. Uh, in terms of unsupervised techniques, you may have heard of clustering or k-means clustering. Um, that's one unsupervised approach. And there was actually an SGF paper last year on some unsupervised approaches related to fraud. Uh, for this paper, this year I focused on the bottom half of the slide, supervised learning. So looking where we're working for uh, to classify new data based on historic data or what's typically called a training data set. Um, so we're trying to find where this new data fits relative to what we've seen from historic patterns. So the first algorithm I'll mention is logistic regression. This uh, family is kind of the, the grandparents, I guess, of, of a lot of the other models. Um, widely used, heavily used for many, many years. Uh, what, what a logistic regression does is measure the relationship between the response or the outcome variable, so in this case fraud, and the independent variables or the input variables. Some of the strengths of the logistic regression are that it's widely used. So it's used quite heavily in industry, so people are familiar with using it and both you know, what, what it looks like, the outcome. Um, the other thing that's really nice about it, it gives a calculated relationship for each input variable with the outcome, again, in this case looking at fraud. One of the weaknesses, a major weakness that, that a lot of people find is they consider the underlying math complicated. Um, so if you don't have a real strong math background, um, that might come off as, as a complication in using uh, logistic regression. And when I look at these algorithms, one way I, I like to think about them is whether the model, um, this is a Patrick Mayer interpretation of models, whether they fit the data or they split the data. I look at regression models as a type of model or an algorithm that actually fits the data. So we'll try and fit a pattern to the data. Uh, the next model we mentioned, which is decision trees, I kind of uh, term these that they, they split the data or partition the data uh, to fit that model to the data. So a few strengths about decision trees. One right off the bat, they make no assumption about the distribution of the data. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a normal distribution. Um, other strengths include that it's very straightforward to interpret these models. Uh, they generate basically if-then or Boolean type logic that's easy to interpret. And not only is it easy to interpret the results, but then implement those, uh, for example, in a, a rules-based system. So this is one of the uh, machine learning algorithms that's very easy to take the results and implement a rules-based system. 
a couple weaknesses with decision trees. They can overfit the data and other adjustments that can be made to mitigate that, uh, but they tend to overfit the data. The other thing, uh, with just a small change or perturbation in the data, you can get a very different looking decision tree. So as your data changes over time, um, the decision tree might look quite different. It might go from being a, a really good performing model to maybe a not so good performing model if your underlying data changes. And related to decision trees are what's called a forest or a random forest. And I really debated putting this one in here as a, it's maybe not a separate class because it's based on decision trees, but these are very popular. So again, the goal here being capturing what, what are the most popular models or algorithms. Um, so strength of a random forest for many data sets, they produce a highly accurate classifier. So they're really great at classifying that historic data. Uh, ensemble model approach, meaning this takes a combination of models so an ensemble model, typically, uh, you can find some really good predictive power based on combining the kind of the best of models. So the random force combines the best of, of what it finds in the decision trees. Um, so here you see from the little graphic, I like the graphics, they help me understand the models, um, takes the averages of, of all of the decision trees to create this ensemble model. However, like other ensemble models, a weakness can be interpret interpreting the results of this model. So unlike the previous slide where you saw a decision tree that's kind of one set of rules, here you're looking at multiple sets of rules and combining them. So that does uh, create a complication in terms of interpreting the data. And if you think about fraud and the uses of, of fraud or, or fraud abuse, um, typically there is some exp explanation that has to be done to both internal and external clients, but also from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, to regulators, regulators typically within the government. So that becomes a complication with random force specifically and more generally ensemble models can be, can be a challenge or difficult to interpret. I mentioned earlier the models that kind of fit the data and this is where I picture a neural network and I really like the graphic on the left. It helps me remember what a neural network does. But neural networks might, you might hear them phrase deep learning typically used in what's called deep learning scenarios. Uh, they're, they're able to fit really complex patterns of data. Um, some strengths include the ability to model nonlinear and complex relationships. Another nice thing about neural networks, there's no assumption of independence on the uh, or normality for the input variables. So it can be used by, against many different types of data. Weakness with neural network, and if you've done spent any time with them or even just reading about them, they can be difficult to interpret. There's some ways around that. But again, in terms of uh, explanation to internal and external clients or to regulators, neural networks can be a challenge. The next algorithm that I took a look at was a naive Bayes classifier, um, widely used, a very popular algorithm, I'd say right now. Uh, the basic idea is simple, that each input variable by itself has something to say about whatever it is you're trying to predict. So in this case, we're trying to predict or capture fraud. Um, so again, it, it has some strengths, just that as soon as you grab an input variable, it's starting to kind of make that, that classification. So naive Bayes classifier, they are widely used, they're highly interpretable, uh, and they give you a calculated relationship for each predictor variable, just like we saw with the regression model. Uh, a big weakness, though, is that uh, the assumption that all features are independent, so all the input variables. Um, as we know, working with real-life data, many times the, the, the input variables or are correlated with each other. Um, so that can be a challenge in terms of working with a, a naive Bayes classifier. K nearest neighbor, uh, this classifies the new cases according to the most similar cases in the training set. Again, this is what I'd say it's really um, taken off, become quite popular in the last few years. It's very simple to implement. That's one of the major attractions. Um, it's also flexible to the types of data that, that you feed it. It's called a lazy learning method as opposed to eager learning method. So it's kind of learning as you're feeding data. Um, I will say as someone who's taught a bit, uh, this, this algorithm is confused pretty heavily with, uh, with k-means clustering. Uh, the names are similar and both uh, rely on distance functions. So uh, if I put on my professor hat, if you want to be a little bit mean and trick your students, um, you can maybe throw them questions, a lot of questions about k-means clustering compared to k-nearest neighbor. 
techniques. Again, K-Nearest Neighbor, this algorithm that we're looking at is a supervised uh, training technique where we're looking at you know, feeding that historic data. K-Means, again, is unsupervised technique. So that's the biggest difference. Um, one big downside of, of K-Nearest Neighbor, uh, there's a high computation cost because we're trying to keep the distance of each query or each input instance against uh, the training sample. So um, it can be costly as far as computation and can take longer to calculate. Uh, but again, with the horsepower that's available today, many people are implementing these um, as, of, as of the last few years. Another algorithm that's, that's really popular is support vector machines. I'd say within the past really 10 years, these have really taken off. Um, very popular algorithm, uh, high accuracy uh, as far as the strength, ability to deal with high dimensional data, you know, lots of variables, and also the ability to generate nonlinear decision boundaries. So a lot of strengths in terms of what the support vector machine offers. Uh, however, as you might get from, from the strengths, I just said that's a lot of work. Uh, so support vector machines don't perform, and this is all relative, don't perform relatively well with large data sets due to training time. Again, with the horsepower available in terms of computing uh, power nowadays, it's not as much a factor, but it's something to keep in mind relative to other techniques. It would take longer to, to train the model. Um, and again, earlier I talked about algorithms that either uh, split or fit the data. In the case of support vector machine, this is one that really does split the data. Uh, it finds a, a best hyperplane that puts one class uh, you know, separation between the classes, in this case, one above and one below. So again, this is one of the algorithms that really splits the data. So that's it in terms of the, the algorithms that, that I went and researched and saw in terms of what is, what is popular. And I thought, well, geez, wouldn't it be great if we could take all these algorithms and implement them somehow in SAS? And guess what? We can. Uh, there's a tool that lends itself really well to these techniques and more, uh, is SAS Visual Data Mining and Machine Learning. Uh, SAS VDM, VDMML, uh, it's a mouthful, uh, offers a lot of different techniques and algorithms and models in terms of, you know, what you can build. The nice thing, there are some templates. That's how I started this exercise. I took some predefined templates that are offered in the product to then build out these algorithms. Um, and so in this case, I started with uh, what's called an advanced template for a class target. And it gave me this kind of a, a view in the user interface where I'm building models. Uh, one thing I did change or take out, I took out what's called the ensemble model. Um, one, as I mentioned earlier, ensemble models can be difficult to interpret. So I wanted to take that out uh, and make it maybe a more real life scenario where, hey, I might not be able to explain this to a client or to a regulator. Um, and also what I did was, um, Quite frankly, the ensemble model would do better uh, than a lot of these models. So I wanted to take out the one model that had a big advantage. So started with one of the predefined templates and I added it. Of course, the product gives complete leeway where one can create a, a model flow. This is called a model flow uh, within Model Studio. So we're using VDMML within SAS Studio, um, to, excuse me, within Model Studio to create this flow. So in terms of, before we get to what I actually did and working with the data, um, one thing to look at is how well do the models or the algorithms perform? And the really nice thing, there are a whole bunch. Um, and I'm not here to tell you what's the best way to do it because it really depends on the data. It depends on your industry. It depends on the scenario. Again, the really nice thing is the SAS uh, solution a lot, gives you all these different options. A really typical uh, assessment metric that you use, though, is what's called the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. It's a really commonly used metric. It's a really, in my opinion, a quick eyeball technique to say, hey, how well is this model performing, especially when I'm looking at many different models and I want to get a sense of how well they're performing. There are other assessment measures people look at to misclassification rate, uh, false positive rate. Another one that's a, kind of a nice and more recent, uh, more recently been highlighted is the false discovery rate. And it's also available in VDMML. So it's a nice, uh, just another kind of tool in your tool belt as you're looking at these algorithms assessing what is the best performing. I will say for this exercise, I did look at the, uh, the, the rock curve or the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve as kind of a quick assessment. But then I did look at the, the misclassification rate 
And I also did look at the false discovery rate. So I kind of use these three criteria quite heavily. Again, there are others. Um, that's probably another topic, another discussion, but there's the ones that I looked at in this exercise. So to demonstrate the use of these techniques, these machine learning algorithms, I used a data set that's out there that's publicly available called the PaySim data set. So it is simulating uh, fraudulent payment activity, fraudulent online payment activity to be more specific. Um, this data set's a kind of a skinny data set. It's only 11 variables, 11 input variables, but just over 6 million observations. So it gave me a significant chunk of data to, to work with um, and take a look at. Um, so again, kind of a skinny, long data set. And uh, get to the punchline really quickly, the decision tree ended up kind of being the, the best performing, not kind of, but was the best performing model. And it was consistent. I took a 10%, in this case, if you look at the slide, a 10% event rate, meaning that uh, fraud occurred 10% of the time, which would be artificially high, but I was uh, oversampling is what we call it in this case. Um, so against a 10% sample of a tree had the lowest misclassification rate and the lowest uh, false discovery rate, as well as the highest area under the curve. Uh, as I tested it though against a 1% sample and then the real life sample, which is like 0.1% of fraud uh, of fraud happening in cases, the tree consistently perform, performed better than some of the other models. Um, leave it at that. Um, here's kind of a, a, a quick screenshot of, of decision tree results. And you'll see we captured like 98.4% of, of fraud within the first few splits of a decision tree. So again, really highlighting just the one result set here uh, from the decision tree, just given the time to go over uh, everything in this presentation. And then a really nice thing uh, at the project level, so you could have multiple data flows or model, excuse me, multiple model flows within a project. I only had one here to keep it simple. But if we had multiple model flows going on, um, we can get a view at the project level. So this is telling me what's the best performing model. Uh, it's telling me what the event rate, you know, how often fraud happened in the original data set. You'll see I did this way back in January and uh, you know, I said, I hope this presentation is going well. So hopefully that still holds. Um, so the nice feature here, and this is, you know, to me, the punchline on a graphical user interface is that it allows you some model governance as far as, you know, it's the modeling tool, but it's keeping track of the metadata, you know, the data about the input data I'm using, the data about the models I'm using, um, and the data about the models and how well they perform. So again, it's nice in terms of documentation. So in conclusion, uh, in this session, you know, we really wanted to highlight some of the most popular machine learning algorithms um, again, so we've taken what would probably be a couple weeks of a graduate level course and condensed it into 20 minutes here in terms of covering the models, uh, but then taking those models and implementing them in SAS. Um, you know, we use some typical classification criteria here, uh, and in this specific case, the decision tree gave us the best performance uh, relative to looking at the, you know, the area under the curve, uh, the lowest uh, false discovery rate, and also the lowest misclassification rate. Here are some references. I'd say some of these are great uh, to look at or very helpful for me, and they might be for you in terms of what you may want to look at. Some are more industry specific. Some are a little more academic in nature, and some, as you see, are offered by SAS Institute as well. Um, so again, some nice references to check out if this is an area of interest for you. So thank you again, and I appreciate your time. And uh, if you have any re questions on this, um, again, this is kind of a tip of the iceberg presentation. There are a lot of ways to go with, with these models, with these algorithms, uh, and with the products. You can always reach out via email, patrick.mayor at sas.com. Thank you very much.